right, my name is Sevalud Petriu, and I'm going to be acting as the MC today. Um, also, people call me Lottie, if, if you have trouble <laughs> saying that first name. <laughs> so, uh, I thank you all for coming and uh, for being here. Um, so, I thank everybody for being here, the audience, the mayor, uh, the church that is hosting us, um, and two other people which I'll mention later. Uh, so, um, I'm not going to hold up the show, and to start off, I'm going to introduce um, Reverend David Prentice from the Trinity Episcopal Church of Melrose for some comments and to begin with a prayer. Thank you, Lloyd. I'll be opting for that pronunciation of your name. I'll go for the E2 in there. Welcome to Trinity Church, everybody. On behalf of the church, I want to welcome you to this and let you know how honored we are that you're all here and we have this exhibit here. One of the main reasons we're honored to have this exhibit here is because as Christians, as a church, we believe in sharing stories. We believe in the importance of our stories. We share them and often and learn more about each other and than we learn. But as you know, at this point in life, not all the stories that we share are happy. Especially in the news these days, we hear quite a few stories from the Ukraine. And often these stories are tragic and very hard stories. But these are stories that are also punctuated with bravery, strength, perseverance, and love of country. In this exhibit, as I understand it, we will hear tell of uh, over four million people dying from starvation, unbelievably in a famine that was largely orchestrated by the Soviet government. But it's not just telling our stories that's important. It's important to listen and pay attention to these stories, too. Someone much wiser than I once said, we need to pay attention to our past because those who cannot remember the history are therein doomed to repeat that history. So what we do here today, we remember. And I want to begin by offering a prayer for peace. This is based on some word, words from Coretta Scott King, modified slightly into a prayer. Let us pray. May we come to know that nonviolence is the only credible solution to violence. May we come to know that everything and retaliation always lead to the cycle of anger, fear, and more violence. May we come to know that the greatness of community is most accurately portrayed by the compassionate actions of its members. And the blessings of God, Creator, Word, and Holy Spirit be upon you and all those that you love this day and always. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you, Reverend Prentice. That was pretty moving. Um, next up, I would like to introduce Paul Brower, Brower from the uh, city of Melrose, the mayor. Everyone has a tricky name today, I suspect. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, thank you to the Ukrainian Cultural Center of New England and the Ukrainian American Educational Center for their organization of this event. I also want to extend my gratitude to Andrei Boyko, Alona Padali, and Phil Kokora for working together to bring this exhibit to Melrose. I will say, we are proud to live in Massachusetts, one of nine states in America, that have recognized the Hulador, I hope I'm saying that correctly, genocide, and that's as of um, 2018, we join other nations throughout the world in recognizing the genocide as well. And most importantly, as a city, we want our Ukrainian community, both here in Melrose and throughout the region, to understand that we see you, we hear you, and we stand by you. <coughs> This year has been a true test of resilience for the Ukrainian community. 
However, I, I was proud to witness this community coming together to, to support you through donation drives, vigils, and most importantly, the awareness of actions against Ukraine showed the power of a community, of your community, that has been subject to injustice and invisibility for far too long. Beginning on 90 years ago, Soviet, Soviet authorities created a false understanding, a false narrative of the actions of Holodomor through the dissemination of information, more simply put, by falsifying history. Today, we understand these dangers of denying and falsifying simple truths. The exhibit is a powerful tribute to the Ukrainian people who are subject to horrific mass starvation, the weaponization and the politicization of a basic need like food. I am grateful to be here opening this display to bring awareness to our city, to the city of Melrose and the larger community. We only grow as a community by understanding the past. And we know that genocide runs through history and continues to ravage the world today. Education is prevented, is prevention, and the preservation of human stories, as the Reverend mentioned, helps keep our community strong and safe from repeating those actions again. Too many times when we reflect on history, we say, no more. We will remember, and yet we see the repeating. We see the re repetition of history and the inhumanity of some groups against others. And it needs to be called out, and it needs to stop. So thank you very much to the team of researchers and academics who work to, under, to grow and maintain our understanding of these horrors. And most importantly, to the survivors and their families who aid in our understanding this experience, thank you both for your sacrifice, you have our compassion, you have our support, and you have our commitment that we will continue to tell the story and work to stop it from happening again. But today, I encourage all of you to walk through this, this exhibit in the context of our world today and our conflicts that we see throughout the world today. When we learn as a community, we grow as a community, and I'm honored to see so many of you here today. Thank you very much, and please enjoy the rest of the ceremony. Thank you, Mayor Paul Broder. <laughs> Get it right this time. I, I'm going to put my glasses on to do better. <laughs> OK. Uh, so I'm going to take my hat off as the MC and put my hat on as the president of the Ukrainian Congress Committee of America, Boston branch. And I'm going to make a couple of remarks or a few remarks about this exhibit also, although the mayor has done an excellent job and saved me <laughs> a lot of work, which is great. Um, as the mayor mentioned lately, we've been hearing about Ukraine in the news. And this exhibit, I hope, will afford us the opportunity to learn more about Ukraine. Hopefully, to add the context, to that context, two factors. One was the Holodomor, which is the past genocide horror that happened in the 30s. And secondly, learning a little bit more about the Ukrainians who are living here in the, ever since the 1880s, who come to the greater Boston area and what they've been doing in their lives. Um, and that's the two parts of this exhibit. Uh, as the mayor mentioned, the Holodomor was an attempt to destroy the Ukrainian nation as a potential entity or concept that was separate from the approved Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic of the Socialist of uh, the Russian system. To achieve the goal, Stalin's regime starved to death millions. Four million is sort of the current number. The number is constantly being bounced back and forth. It was as high as 12, as low as four, seven to 10, in my opinion, is the right number. But um, the scholars are saying four now, so the mayor is right with the, with the scholars. Um, but there are other scholars. So 
But it was such a secret event that no one really kept count. There is, I, and I'm assuming there will be a uh, comment from a survivor <laughs> that will point to that more in this program. Um, the other thing that happened is it wasn't just starvation of primarily the rural area of Ukraine, which was the backbone of Ukraine, uh, the farming area, uh, the agricultural community, but also much of the clergy and the intelligentsia were killed or deported. So it was sort of an attempt to eliminate um, that segment of society. And we kind of know the Soviet system is not big on having an informed public as part of there, <laughs> where here in the U.S. we are. Um, so the exhibit is a good summary of the whole of the Moor, and we're focusing on it simply because uh, November was the month assigned to commemorating and remembering the whole of the Moor. On the 26th specifically is a day that internationally uh, Ukrainians come out and light candles and remember and do uh, events which the uh, Ukrainian Cultural Center of New England, who is working on this event, also did an event in Boston Common on the 26th, which was very successful um, to mark that day. Uh, also December 9th, which just passed, is the International Genocide Remembrance and Prevention Day. So. We're right in the ballpark. <laughs> All right. Uh, but the main reason that people are reacting to this genocide now and are working on it is that it's occurring again. It's now missiles and bombs and bullets instead of food. But the goal is the same, to sort of destroy Ukraine as a nation. And that is what's got the whole of the more, you know, up to the current position. In justification, or opposed to <coughs> the horrors of the whole of the more, there is this exhibit section on the um, Ukrainians of the greater Boston area, who started coming here as early as the 1880s. Um, and this exhibit, that part of the exhibit, demonstrates the resilience, the fortitude of a people who always find a way to make good in the world. And I'm going to be a little personal. My parents came here with $10 and a suitcase each. <laughs> and they did fine. And they're doing fine. There was no free Ukraine for them to choose. They chose to be free Americans. And um, that's important. So I hope that this exhibit will provide some revelation of truth, a sense of hope, and a better appreciation of what Ukraine can be if it's given a chance. And I'm taking off my hat <laughs> as the UKK and going back to the MC. Um, next up we have uh, Maxim Boyko reading some um, survive, all of the more survivor memoirs with Olena Tsar playing the bandura on as a background music. So if we could get the chair and get them up here, that would be great. But before they start, I do want to say something that um, I want everybody to note the instrument that Olena is holding. That is a bandura that is a uh, very traditional Ukrainian instrument. And in addition to the horrors of the whole of the Moor that oh, I had talked about earlier, uh, Stalin wasn't quite satisfied uh, with that. So in 1933, he called what was presumably a conference of the banduristi, the players of this instrument. Um, and he gathered about 1,500 of these minstrels together. And these were generally blind minstrels who eked out a living for them and usually some uh, orphan child that was their leader, you know, their lead dog in a way, brought them around. 
uh, by singing, um, I have a good line here, so I want to read it actually and not just go from memory. Um, basically, they sang songs of Ukrainian history, songs of the Ukrainian spirit, and passed that on from generation to generation. So he brought them together, and then they were all murdered. And it was in an attempt to eliminate that form of passing information. Well, it failed. We still have people playing, <laughs> and they're good. All right, I'm done. Thank you. Nearly 10 people entered the house. They threatened to kill us one by one until we gave them everything we had. They beat, killed, and arrested people. Send them to Siberia. They were all armed. People hit everything and tried to escape their villages. They didn't get very far because Stalin's god dogs could find them anywhere. Yevdokia Fashenko. Mikola Melin. This starvation was all due to Stalin's orders. He didn't like Ukrainians and wanted to exterminate them. His henchmen would come and seize everything they could find. Katerina Panchenko. They took away everything. Everything. If they found food, they took it away. Such was the decision by the party and the government. If you hit some food, they could send you to Siberia. There was no way people could defend themselves because they were also threatened to be sent to Siberia. Natalia Budkevich. Many private farmers starved to death. Those who were still alive could barely walk. Entire families were dying. First of all, men and children. Funeral carts gathered the dead and threw them into a white pit. Sometimes survivors were too weak to bury the dead, so they covered them with earth in pits and ditches. Yefrosenia Poplovets. They went from house to house, confiscating lard, potatoes, wheat. They searched through chests and they they searched through chests and any embroidered clothes were seized if they were found. To save our embroidered shirts, we put them under our, our old wrecked jackets. It didn't work. They undressed us and took the shirts to eradicate any national spirit in the household. they get her set up, uh, perform a song. We're going to do two songs, first Elena, then another. Both songs have the same name, which is Svicha. And that word can get translated two ways, either a candle or a witness. I mean, both kind of shed light on things. Um, so the two songs are different. They have different lyrics written by different people. Same name, <laughs> which makes it hard. When, when I read the words, uh, for me, that's just my opinion, and I'm not a music person. The first song is more the candle story, and the second is more the witness part of the word. Um, and so I'm going to step away and put it to the bill.
Пока я стою за полюю свечу. soloist, vocalist at the Vinitsky Regional Philharmonic, uh, and she has an excellent voice. <laughs> so. Про страшну біду, не долю, про 
song and uh, that's going to be the blue of a kind men's capella chorus I'm sure you're all familiar with them most of you are familiar. and they are going to be singing a song that in Ukrainian is Boże Veliki which is um, can be translated as a prayer for Ukraine. Um, it has become sort of the unofficial uh, <clears throat> anthem, and many of the church services these days are ending with this prayer. And so the, the service is about to finish, and the congregation sings the song, and then it's over. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys.
That was excellent. You guys can take that show on the road. <laughs> you know? All the way to Ukraine, it would work. They would do it. Excellent, excellent. Okay, um, we're coming to the close. Uh, I'm gonna make two pitches. <laughs> this is like you know, channel two, you learn something and you have to find out who's sponsoring. Uh, so, uh, one, we have a poster over there with a uh, QR code. Um, which will take you to the White House. And we are looking for people to contact the White House and ask <coughs> that the US recognize the Holodomor as a genocide. Mm -hmm. They have recently recognized the Armenian genocide, but the Holodomor not officially as the US government. Mm -hmm. Individual states have, is about 27 at this point that have issued proclamations and Massachusetts is, is as the mayor said 2018 we're in um, And so that's a push and that's a, a plug uh, Second this exhibit and a lot of graphic work has been uh, Done at CRG graphics and they're a company that's been very friendly to us in terms of getting things done, and so their logo is down at the bottom somewhere. But I would mention them, because Andrea asked me to mention them. <laughs> okay. uh, and, and it's important, because uh, I mean, we've been working with them for a long time. Um, they do good work, too. I mean, we came up with thoughts of what we wanted. They did the designs. And it was pre pretty good, I think. Okay, uh, and what was the last thing? We have a guest book here. And if people would like to sign it, they can. It's useful for us to kind of document how many people have seen these exhibits. Uh, and if you do want to know about more events, you can write your email. And they'll add you to an email list. And I don't think they'll send too many emails. I hope. <laughs> but that's, that's a personal choice. Um, I don't think, is there anything else? I think that's all I've got right now, except, no, no, <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> I'm just trying to get the, the, the stuff out of the way. Okay, uh, two people, as the mayor mentioned, have really worked hard on this. One, Andri, but mostly Phil Kukura. And so he deserves the first <laughs> Will not see me again. It's now a show. Well, I come before you wearing several hats. One from Trinity Church to welcome you and to thank you for coming uh, to this exhibit, which is, as you have heard again and again, to dis to help build awareness of the, the struggle that goes on in Ukraine today coming out of many years in the past, like this dreadful uh, famine that we're looking at the display of today. Uh, it is uh, a pleasure on behalf of Trinity to welcome you and to tell you that uh, if you would spread the word about this exhibit to friends who might also be interested, uh, it would be useful in making people more aware of the dreadful uh, occurrences that have been a part of Ukrainian history. Uh, it has been a pleasure uh, working with Andri and with Lodi uh, in uh, helping bring this together. Uh, it, it, they have been uh, right on top of the situation right from the get-go, and really a, a very great pleasure on my behalf uh, to be able to work with them. Uh, the rest of it is, uh, as Lodi has always said, please sign the guest book, which will be on this lectern over here on the side. Uh, I would call your attention to a couple things that you might have missed. Uh, and one is the cookbook uh, on the wall there, uh, which is not officially part of the display, but is an indication of what people were reduced to eating in the famine period. And <laughs> nothing dramatizes it quite so effectively as looking at the literal details of what people were reduced to eating in order to stay alive. Uh, the, uh, the rest of it is something I hope you will find um, illuminating. Enjoyable isn't the right word, but enjoyable in the sense that 
you build an awareness of it and carry that forward. Thank you again for coming. Uh, it is a pleasure to welcome you. Thank you. Thank you.